Good afternoon. My name is David Lamb, and I'm with the Soil Health Institute, and I want to welcome you all to the Healthy Soil Farmer Showcase. Uh, this week, we're going to showcase the producers in South Carolina, and kind of the focus of this presentation or this showcase is the lessons that they've all learned over the last eight or nine years and how they've implemented soil health management and related to regenerative ag. Next slide, please. You know, you know, for the past seven weeks, we've been going through these showcases, starting in Mississippi and talking about some of the challenges of there in Texas and Arkansas, California, uh, Georgia. And then last week we were talking with producers in North Carolina. But the goal of everything has been what you're seeing right here. This is what we're trying to get farmers to adopt. The, the idea of being able to grow cotton into those heavy, high biomass residues is kind of scary to some folks. Uh, this is some photos, I believe, from Doug Newton Farm, one of our presenters today. And you can see, yeah, cotton seed can come up through that. It can be closed. Uh, you can see the wheat control that's going in. And finally, down in the, in the lower right-hand corner, eventually we're going to put on some sets of bowls, and that's going to be a pretty nice-looking cotton crop. And that's the, the whole process as you go throughout the growing season. Go ahead, Shelly, advance slide. The healthy soil for uh, sustainable uh, – the healthy soil – Sustainable Cotton Showcase is part of the, of the Sustainable Cotton Project, which is a joint effort between the Soil Health Institute in partnership with Wrangler Jeans and the Walmart Foundation. Go ahead, Kelly. Most of you probably have not heard of the Soil Health Institute. We were founded about five or six years ago with a, the idea or the mission to safeguard and enhance the vitality and productivity of, the, of our nation's soil through two things, scientific research and advancement. And the whole idea is we're trying to bring that scientific community in to look and see and, and help uh, identify that science that supports the regenerative ag and the soil health activities that you're going to hear our, produ our farmers talk about today. Next slide, please. Of course, things like this don't happen overnight or without some kind of funding. Uh, we appreciate the funding we get from these folks, the Wrangler brand, the VF Foundation, and the Walmart Foundation have been uh, generously supporting this project for the last two years, and uh, we have one more year, and hopefully we'll have uh, some good positive income outcomes to come from that. Next slide, please. Of course, the goal of the project is pretty simple. We want to see the adoption of more soil health management systems that you're going to be hearing examples of through Jason and Doug and Sonny's system today, and also to kind of quantify the benefits and the, and the, the economic and the environmental benefits that, that are to help uh, uh, or drive these systems and the interest from not only the community, the agricultural community, but from society as a whole. Next slide. And what we've had, uh, this is the seventh one. Uh, you can see we've had started back in February. We've had six other. These are all available for replay off of the Soy Health Institute's YouTube channel. Uh, you can uh, go on there when you get done. And uh, this one will be available next week. Uh, on Monday or Tuesday, you'll be able to send us out and be able to view this if you want. And we have one more. Uh, we're going to conclude next week with why soil health is important to the future of the cotton, uh, U.S. cotton. And in this one, we're going to switch. It's not instead of having a farmer base, we're going to have a kind of industry base. Have a couple of representatives from the brands, uh, those a couple of folks from Cotton Inc., and even uh, uh, somebody from the Soil Health Institute kind of talking about the science behind it and also why uh, sustainable cotton is beneficial to be uh, for, for cotton as a whole. Next slide, please. What we're trying to do is get farmers to change how they view soil. soil. You know, we all went through soils. We all understand that there's sand, silt, and clay particles and the chemical and the, and the structural analysis and all that. But, but, but most of us have forgotten there's a living component. So what we, we advocating the adoption of this definition of soil health uh, to help farmers focus on this and, the, and, the, and this brings it out the, the definition being a continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital li living ecosystem that sustains plants animals and humans you know the, the, the idea of a continuing capacity and we're not just talking about one or two years but we're looking about sustainability over the course of the next 30 40 50 years that this is the way, way we'll be farming in the future trying to get producers to look at the soil as a living ecosystem i, I appreciate doug he sent me countless photos of his cropping system over the last couple of years and how the, the, the life that he's uh, discovering or revealing underneath the soil. And the last one, the, the, the role of soil 
and the functions they provide in growing our food and fiber across society or for, for, for society. Go ahead and advance the next slide there, Shelly. What are those necessary functions? Well, we have to have soils are very important to nutrient cycling. You know, most of the fertilizer that's put out there does not end up into that plant and in a given year it has to go through a biological process. We rely on our soil to, to capture, to let water infiltrate and fill that soil profile and then to give it back up later on in the growing season when it's necessary. We expect our soils to filter and buffer out pollutants, you know, break down some of those products that we apply. If it wasn't for that biological activity in the soil, uh, those could become uh, potentially po uh, possibly uh, problems in our for water quality and such. Uh, we expect to be able to get the crop out. You know, we got to be able to cross our fields so the, the soil has to provide a phys physical stability and support to, to run combines and equipment and plant and do all those kinds of things. And then, the, then it, we won the last two we really don't think much about, but really soil is a habitat. And it's for all those microbes, those earthworms or other arthropods that live in the soil. You can see that nice picture right there. There's a couple of earthworms there. Uh, very, very common. And we can, we can ask, ask our producer today what their earthworm populations have seen and whether they're on the rise or decline. You know, but most of this, most folks don't realize that 90% of these soil functions are driven by the biological activity that's found in the soil. Next slide, Shelly. And what you're going to be hearing from these four or uh, three producers along with, with Buzz is emphasis on these four basic soil health principles, you know, minimizing disturbance and maximizing cover. What does that do? Well, by avoiding tillage and misuse of you know, farm inputs, those types of things, we protect that habitat. We allow for a more uh, robust biological activity to take place. We protect soil aggregates that are so important to allow uh, you know, form those big pore spaces to allow water to infiltrate. And also to provide a way, a means to increase organic matter. And that'll be something we'll be asking them. And the other two principles focus more on the other side of feeding those, the biology in the soil, if you will, those microbes. You know, I'm sitting here uh, in Southern Georgia right now and the pollen is flying, my truck's turned yellow. There's a lot of biological activity taking place today. The sun's not necessarily shining, but I can guarantee you folks, photosynthesis is taking place and pollen is in the air and, and it's just a good example that we don't maximize the amount of solar energy that hits the surface of the earth you know and and, and with these systems we'll talk about they'll, they'll uh, be able to demonstrate that they are trying to capture more of it and then the last one there is to maximize diversity whether it be diversifying by increasing the number of crops grown by using the multi-species cover crops or as this picture indicates, even bringing a few cows back into the system, you know, to, to, to graze in a, in a managed uh, way so we can increase the biological and the soil, and soil health a, 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 as a whole. Uh, next slide there, Kelly, or Shelly. And as we go along, this is going to be interactive. Jason Carter is going to be our kind of our featured speaker. He's going to highlight some things that's going on on his farm today. But also, we're going to allow Sonny and Doug and Buzz to chime in uh, where they feel they, you know, kind of talk about their systems of way. So don't, uh, you know, uh, get uh, discouraged or anything. But if you got a question, don't hesitate to type it in and begin, uh, uh, and we'll answer those as we go along the process instead of waiting until the end. And I will say something at the end, and I'll remind you then too at the end that we do appreciate it if you take the time to complete the survey. And that helps us to you know, get your feeling of what you're uh, whether you thought it was worthwhile or not, and also some ideas for future educational activity. And with that, I'm going to introduce our, our four presenters today. We've got Jason Carter, who is a pres uh, farmer down just outside of uh, uh, southeast of uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, we also have Doug Newton and Sonny Price. Our two producers are down more along in the Dillon, South Carolina area. And then last, but certainly not least, is Dr. Buzz Clude, who, who works for the University of South Carolina and has been involved with soil health for the last 10 or 12 years, or if not longer. And he's worked with the, these three producers and with others uh, to help uh, foster a, a, an effort of soil health there in the state of uh, South Carolina that's pretty unique. And, and I'll ask him more about their cover crop, uh, Carolina cover crop connection later on in the presentation. And then we're going to conclude with the economics. Uh, uh, Dr. Archie Flanders did a talk with Sonny, captured some economic information, and he's going to share some of the uh, results towards the end of the presentation. So with that, Jason, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and start, uh, start your presentation.
Thank you, David. Um, so, yeah, Jason, I'm Jason Carter, um, arm in East Over, South Carolina. Uh, our farm's located in the center of the state, and uh, we're on the coastal plain soils. Um, typical organic matter in, in the soils around here, one percent or less. Um, eight years ago, when I started with cover crops, um, our organic matter that we recorded at the time was probably about 0.6. And even though we had been no-till or strip-till for many years, organic matter was not building up. And it wasn't until we started with cover crops that we saw an increase in our organic matter. And today our organic matter is about one and a half to 2%. In 2012, uh, people always ask, well, why did you decide to start with the cover crops? Well, at the time, you know, there wasn't anyone around me growing cover crops. And I was just reading, I guess, in the farm magazines about what people were doing out in the Midwest. Um, NRCS had a, some programs to sign up for, so I didn't really see where I had anything to lose. There was a part of the seed, so came up with a little mix. And this is what I planted the first year and brought, borrowed a grain drill from my neighbor and, and planted the entire farm. This was my planting rig at the time, and this is how most people around me and probably throughout the southeast plant, this strip-till rig where we have the subsoiler and the planter hooked together. And after my cover crops came up, you know, I was ready to, you know, plant into them. But when they got about knee high, I got pretty scared. Um, I said, like, how am I going to plant through all that, that biomass out there? So I, I burned them down and planted into it fine, but I noticed the residue didn't last long. I, I should have let the cover crop grow a little bit longer. Chicken litter is pretty much our primary source of fertility, and we um, apply anywhere from one to two tons per acre. Um, this is a shot of the, you can see the soybeans on the left and the corn on the right, and you can tell by the mixes that there's a lot more grass in the, in the soybean mix, because we really don't need the, as many legumes in the soybean mix. We're really going after the, the real heavy rye cover crop to shade out the ground, to hold back the moisture in the weeds. And then on the corn, you don't see as much grass. We're really heavier on the legumes in the, in the corn mix because we're really after the, uh, the nitrogen from the legumes. Jason, let me, let me interrupt you here a second. So what was your, besides getting funding from NRCS, what was it you were looking for to change in your system? Uh, why did you go to adopting a system like well, that? Well, I was really interested in the, um, the, the ability to, to get your, your nitrogen source from legumes. Um, you know, at the time, it, there wasn't much talk about all the benefits of cover crop. I mean, there was there was some some information out there, but my biggest interest was the the nitrogen that you get from the legumes. I said, well, I can plant this cover crop and uh, cut back on my nitrogen application. And, but, uh, okay, then, then let me um, let me ask each of you. You said you started off at 0.6 percent soil organic matter. Now, what would be? Cut, back up a slide there. Kind of show us that residue there. Uh, what what would be your organic matter on the average today? I would say anywhere from one and a half to two percent. So in basically eight nine years, you've been able to, to double it. Yeah, it, that's pretty. It, that's when we first started, we were seeing about a two tenths of a percent gain each year. It's kind of slowed down, I would say, in the past couple of years. Um, but yeah, it's it's. It's common to see, you know, a two tenths of a percent gain each year. Okay. Well, what what about you, Sonny? What was your your reason for getting it started? Uh, uh, related a uh, a system similar to this. Well, ours kind of started with a a conservation innovative grant that um, I got involved in, and uh, with Buzz and. It, from there, that just piqued our interest because we've seen so much. One of the biggest things we've seen with it that year was uh, the fertilization part of it, uh, not cutting back. We cut back on our, our um, applications of phosphorus and potassium and, and, and nitrogen in cotton that year with that in that particular um, seed field that we called it. And uh, so that really piqued peaked our interest when we seen that and then also the following year when we took the soil samples and we got soil samples back uh that one particular field 
showed that I didn't have to have, <laughs> and we were grid sampling, we did, I, I didn't have to put any lime out. And uh, it showed zero, you know, none of the grids. I didn't have to put anything out. Everything was sufficient. And the surrounding fields all around it, you know, I had to, it was, just showed up, you know, two, two ton of lime, a ton of lime, ton and a half. And so that really piqued our interest there. And I, I, that's just got me uh, really excited about it. And so that's kind of how we got started. Okay. Now, now, Buzz, how does, as a researcher, were you, what piqued your interest in this? I'm, I'm, and I'm kind of curious whether are these exceptional farmers to be able to do something like this, or is what you did with them something a farmer can do on his own or working with other farmers in other parts of the country or in other parts of the state? Well, I would say they were exceptional farmers in that they were willing to take risk uh, in the face of a lot of uh, criticism, both from uh, institutions and, and neighbors. So um, I think part of uh, what made that particular conservation innovation grant, apart from the money from the NRCS, was the fact that you had um, several guys who were quite close. Jason was one of them um, and who you know, we basically kept everyone in touch. So we had a support group. So um, I, I, I don't think these guys are bad farmers, uh, but I wouldn't say, you know, they they win yield con contests year in and year out. But I think what bound them all was, you know, they were trying to, uh, they weren't particularly looking at uh, yield per acre. They were looking at how many dollars per acre that they could make and sometimes looking at just yield versus dollars per acre, um, um, you, you, you come up with different numbers. So I think all yeah, of- Yeah, what the, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. But yeah, so I think all of this was an economic incentive. Uh, what drove me is uh, I'm actually um, an aquatic scientist um, and I'm interested in clean water. I was particularly interested in clean water and about uh, 12 or 13 years ago, I met Ray Archuleta, and I had never, never discovered the concept that soil properties could change. I always thought that soil properties were ever, you know, were forever the same. So to find out that soils could change rapidly under management was a brand new thing for me. And that was um, the last time I looked at just aquatic sciences, because we, you know, I very soon found out that if you look at the soils, uh, water quality is going to take care of itself. Okay. Yeah. What? Just really, what? So your SIG was like a three-year project. What was probably one or two of the highlights that you that, that, that you, you kind of revealed or found out that you didn't know uh, beforehand? Um, yeah, that's that's actually documented in a in a video called Farmer Scientists. It's online. You can look at that. But I think what, um, you know, we always looked at crop removal rates and um, assumed that if a crop removed a certain amount of fertilizer that uh, you would have to, uh, your, your next year's soil test would show that. And what we noticed was that our soil test, phosphorus, potassium, um, and then also some of the micronutrients, uh, as we started deploying these cover crops, often our our phosphorus and potassium um, actually just kind of stayed steady uh, over, over several years. Um, and in fact, some of our micronutrients increased. Manganese in one case, well, not in one case, but in a number of cases actually doubled. So it, it kind of surprised us. Uh, and so we had to really rethink this whole idea of grain removal by crop. So that doesn't mean that we haven't seen drops in soil test values uh, over time where we haven't applied fertilizer. But uh, in the field that Sonny was talking about, uh, he hasn't applied any uh, granular um, phosphorus or potassium for seven years, and, and he hasn't applied any lime in that field for seven years. What he's been very careful to do is, is cover crop it every year and make sure that there's a live root in the soil and that he keeps his diversity level up. So typically in, in a three year period, he's gonna have 13 cash or cover crop species growing in that field at some or other time. Yeah, so 
So I want to get back to that. So let, let me ask Doug something. So Doug, what brought you into this? So in, uh, as far as your, your interest and what were you hoping to accomplish is related to the soil health practices you've been doing? I've been feeling uh, really nice. I didn't really see any change to the soil. In fact, I didn't even know to look. Uh, it never occurred to me to, to, to look at the soil in a in a, a biological way. Um, but we had a, a, a situation about 20 years ago where the NRCS uh, funded some, some cover crops and we flew on rye. And that rye cover crop, um, just that one year, seemed to make a, a difference in just the way the soil looked. Uh, not a great amount, but uh, we got away from that when the funding dried up. And then um, we got back into EQIP, uh, the NRCS program, and CSP now, where we are getting a small amount of funding for cover crops. But uh, I farm um, every acre that we that we farm, we we attempt to put cover crop on, and we've seen a change in the in the soil. Um, we've gone from chemical fertilizer to our basic fertility is uh, is chicken litter. And a lot of those things are measurable. You can take your biomass, your, your cover crop, and measure and get a pretty good idea how much nitrogen and uh, P and K you're going to get out of that cover crop and give, your, give yourself a, uh, a credit for that and just put that in your pocket as opposed to writing a check. Um, but that's just basically where I've, where I've been and where I am. Well, one thing when I first had a chance to meet you, we were walking in a field. You had planted some field borders, pollinator habitat, beneficial insect. Uh, are you still doing that, or what's, what's kind of been your, your views on that? It's been not a, a big practice. We've done it on some larger fields. If you start planting a, a 15-foot border around some of the fields we farm, you wouldn't have any field left. <laughs> But on the larger fields, the, those that, you know, from 40 to 80 acres, we, we've, uh, most of them would have a, a 15 foot border of, a, a, I guess you'd call it a pollinator strip, is, is the term you would use. And around that 15 foot border, you're not going to make anything you cut with a, a cash crop anyhow, because the woods are going to suck the juice, the juice out of it anyhow. So we just, uh, uh, have I seen any benefit from that? Other than pretty flowers, I can't guarantee a thing, but we have some, some pretty <laughs> flowers around the edge of the field. A lot of insects. Okay, well, that's good. So, is it okay? So, let, let me ask you, then I want to ask, did, have you seen your organic matter levels go up too? Yes. I don't have the numbers in my head right now, but uh, yes, okay. the organic matter has gone up. It has not gone up drastically, and it's going to be a slow process. Um, but I, we, we'll be able over time to have a really, uh, uh, we'll be able to make a difference with the soil as far as organic matter is concerned. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, let's let Jason continue on. I think you were uh, getting ready to talk a little bit about soil temperatures there, Jason. So why don't you go ahead and, and talk and we'll visit a little more as we go along here. Okay. Yeah. So this one of another benefit that we noticed early on was covered soil versus uncovered, you know, about a 20 degree difference in the soil temperature. Um, and you can see on the right, that is just a vetch cover crop. That's not even a very thick cover crop. And you can see almost a 20 degree difference there. But not only is that going to hold, keep the soil cooler and, and retain moisture, but it's also going to provide an ideal environment for your microbes. Once the temperature gets up so high, the microbes are going to shut down and your earthworms are going to go down deeper. So as long as you can keep that soil covered, um, the, earth, the earthworms and the microbes will continue working and, and unlocking fertility for your cash crop. Uh, the beneficials were something else that we noticed, especially the, the spiders. Um, when we started growing the, the cover crop, we, we could see just the webs and more just insects all out in the fields. And a lot of the insects were, that we were seeing or beneficials that we're seeing were where things were really going to help us out and, and fight some of the pests. And also when the cover crops are uh, attract a lot of the bees, uh, bumblebees and 
honeybees and you'll see a lot of uh, just benefit from you know bee population from the blooms. Jason, what do you got in your cover crop mix? People are always interested in that. What, what uh, do you? I see some rye. I, I change it up each year, but the, yeah, that's the that would be the bruisey rye, radish, um, vetch, clover. I'm not sh exactly sure what the the yellow bloom. Is. I think that might be um, rape, I believe. And yeah, that, yeah, that probably rape. Yeah. That, that mix is probably so what, five years ago. What, so where do you get your information related to that? As far as what to seed, have you come up with a magic portion potion there, so to speak? Or? Changing it each year, but that mix is usually always going to have rye in it, except for this year. This is the first year I've left the rye out of the corn mix and went with um, oats and um, and just changing it up each year. But it's always going to have some one grass, uh, clover, vetch, and radish. That's usually the basics. And then we add from that. Um, different things and different pounds per acre. Okay. Um, in 2014, this was my first year planting natural true no-till and, and it was, wasn't was the plan at the time. Um, this field was planted into uh, with clover and vetch and had radish out there, but they winter killed and then we put two tons of chicken litter out there. And this field was just as slick it was almost like banana peels out there. And when I went to the field and dropped the subsoiler down, the, the tractor, I couldn't get any traction to pull the subsoiler across the field. The tractor was actually spinning on top of the ground. And I was able to make two passes across the field. And I, and I stopped and said, there's no way I'm going to be able to plant my entire corn crop this way. I'm going I'm to have to do something. Um, so I took the subsoiler shanks off the subsoiler and planted the rest of the farm um, corn crop this way. And what I thought was going to be a disaster turned out to be one of the biggest learning lessons because at the end of the year when we checked those strips where we subsoil versus not subsoiling there was zero difference in yield so that showed me right there that you know maybe we don't need to be subsoiling as long as we're using these cover crops so what advantage do you think the cover crops are doing to help you eliminate the need for subsoiling i just think the the, the deep roots um going down and, and just and staying off the field and um and just i think it's just aggregating and making more pore space in the soil making a place for the roots okay. to travel so so sonny have you done something similar to that i know i think i heard you you do 100 percent no-till is that correct that's correct david i i parked my subsoiler now probably for six years uh, almost now, and uh, I was I was kind of like, like I say we've been no tilling since uh, you know the middle eighties, and uh, and we've always run a subsoiler, uh, bought a, a minimum till subsoiler. Uh, we did strip till for a few years, and and then like I say I, I ran into a problem one summer or spring that the subsoil shanks were pulling up boulders but we were back then and in the day we were kind of still uh dissing some land but the land was so hard the subsoilers and i had you know baskets behind it and everything but we just had to i just had a hard hard time that spring so we that kind of eliminated us from subsoil in, in front of right in front of the planter anymore so we went and got another minimum till subsoiler and ran it for a number of years. Uh, and uh, it done a good job. It didn't disturb much of the soil on top, so we just planted it right behind it So um, with our planter. But um, the subsoil that we've done, we quit subsoiling now, like say for about six years, we parked it. Uh, Doug looked at some of my fields and my cotton I don't necessarily have a a tap root in cotton like a uh, conventional till. Um, I got more a bigger root system, I think, but it's more it's more roots running everywhere uh, instead of just straight down on that tap root. But I haven't mm -hmm. seen any. I'm like what Jason was saying. I hadn't seen any uh, crop. Uh, or production failure or um, the drop in production on the cotton. So uh, 
And I can say this, I know that one year that we went out to uh, the other year back when we had all these flat flooding rains, um, I had my soybeans out there and we ran the combine and we got all our beans out. We didn't, we didn't root the fields, didn't bog. And next spring, you know, a lot of the neighbors around were dissing out all the roots all summer long, all spring long, trying to get it ready. And, uh, this had just a pure disaster out there with all the roots. Well, I, I was sitting back home watching the, the news or something. That's, I, we didn't have that problem. So, uh, uh that was so a, a so big that, advantage. Yeah. Big advantage uh, that we seen, uh, being able to get so the crop out the field. Yes, sir. Yeah, being able to support that heavy equipment there. That is, you know, that comes back pretty quickly, too. Yes. Doug, you've sent me a couple videos. Are you dig- oh, go ahead, Sonny. Go ahead. Well, I just, I was just, you know, that's a big expense when you can cut cut something out like that of subsoiling. Uh, you know, yeah. it takes, takes a lot of horsepower to pull. And uh, so that was a big expense that we, we could, we, you know, we just done away with. So, uh, and that yeah. that expense uh, pay for my cover crops. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, that's I'm sure of that. And I think Archie will kind of go through those numbers a little bit later. But Doug, you sent me yes. some videos. Are you doing looking at uh, roots as you digging them up? Kind of what what did you notice, or what, what what have you noticed over time about your root system? You know, on the cover crop itself. Or yeah, the, yeah. On the well, cover and then crop. any and then if if you. I don't think I've ever dug down into the uh, uh, down into the into the soil all the way and not found root uh, all the way to the subsoil, all the way into the clay layer. Um, always have found roots that grow down that deep. Um, so we have a it, it it the cover crops are are really depending on what you planted and that planting really do a good job of, of maintaining uh, a path for your roots to follow to the subsoil. You know, having said that, I've, I've had a, uh, since we had those hurricanes in 2015, 16, um, I did go back and subsoil some, some of the, especially where the, where the dirt, where the water stood it was so compacted okay. that nothing would go in there. So uh, I'm not 100% no-till. I'm almost in a rotation with the tillage, and I've always thought that it ought to be a federal law that if you didn't subsoil, you ought to have to anyhow because, that, like Sonny said, that's a huge expense. And over time, I think we can get to the point uh, on my farm, and that's one thing. Everybody's farm's different. Uh, you got to find your own way. Um but on my farm, we are heading towards where Sonny is right now and where Jason is right now, is eliminating that that uh, subsoil. When you do that, it's a huge expense, uh, uh, money savings when you can get rid of that 300 horsepower tractor and uh, burning 200 oh, yeah. fuel a day. You can, it's a huge expense. So we're headed that direction. Are we there yet? No, but we're headed that way. Okay. So, so Buzz, what I'm hearing is that their roots are getting the cover crops going down at least as deep, if not deeper, than the, what their subsoil are. Can you talk a little bit about what possible benefit that might provide to the cash crop and 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 and, and soil health in general, or what's taking place there? Well, um, you know, I, I guess I'm going to think of it in in very simple terms. The the, the, the soil, it, it boils down to soil function and the soil functions that producers care about most is the ability for the water to infiltrate and then be retained in the soil. So when you have roots in the soil year round, basically you're going to have a mix of small, medium and large pore spaces. The large pore spaces often being because of um, things like uh, earthworms so not only does the water drain well, but because you've got the small and the medium pore spaces in the soil, so because of your soil structure, um, it, it's, it's not, it not only drains well from the surface, but as it goes down, 
it gets retained in, in the soil itself between the soil particles and then becomes available later on. So um, your first thing that the roots do is create that pore space for you. And then the second thing that the roots do is does excite the biology. So on Jason's farm over three years, we uh, did some studies where we had cover crop versus straight up no-till and we saw, saw soil biology increase, but um, wherever we see an increase in soil biology, we also see an increase in nutrient recycling. So um, in other words, a lot of nutrients that we're seeing being recycled, you know, are either coming from the organic matter or actually being accessed directly from the soil mineral particles. Um, and that seems to happen much more in soils that are cover cropped. So we've got experiments okay. that we ran, um, not, not very high tech experiments, but uh, you know, where for four years we ran a, a, a system with six crops, corn, wheat, soybean rotation, where uh, we had a sandy uh, soil, it was an orange berg. And in that time we never applied potassium and yet our soil test potassium. Uh, so we, we had side by side plots and we actually found where we did apply um, 0060 myriad of potash that uh, over the long term, our actual where we applied potash, our, our yields declined slightly. And we think that may, that may have been the salt effect. So these were soils that yeah. medium tested medium for soil test potassium. And we just used land grant university fertilizer recommendations. We also saw that okay. test phosphorus really um, tended not to drop as precipitously as we thought it would. Um, it came down slowly over time, but after the last four years, our soil test phosphorus without applying any was still in the sufficient range. So a lot of things basically, like you said, 90% uh, of soil function is mediated by microbes. And uh, when we have cover crops in that situation, what we're doing is we're harvesting sunlight to uh, put carbon into the ground and then carbon is the energy currency of the soil. So that's a whole foreign concept to many producers, but um, you know, that's about as simple as I can put it. And a guy called Dwayne Beck, who runs Dakota Lake, Lake Research Farm, he says, the main job of a producer is to harvest sunlight and water. And uh, that's, that's what these guys are doing. There you go. So, well, listen, Jason, it sounds like you're getting ready to start talking a little bit in depth about the CIG grant. So why don't you pick it up back then? Right. So this is what Sonny was talking about earlier that Sonny and I and three other farmers participated with, with Buzz doing the research, the conservation innovation grant. And this is, like Sonny said, where we really got the numbers and, and were able to record things and study them over three years to show, you know, what were the benefits. And it being on five separate farms over the state, and we were all seeing the, about the same results and we could cut back on inputs and um, and maintain our yields and increase our organic matter at the same time. And then we also had three field days at my farm. So this center pictures at my shops and had people come out to the farm and really learn more about cover crops. Cause you had to remember this is all a new, even though it's an old concept, it was new to the area, new to the, to agriculture. It's something that kind of been put away in, in the past and it's just coming back. So it was a good way to educate everyone on, on the benefits and uh, look at the results that Buzz came up with to, sh to show that it's working. Mm -hmm. well, this is what I like you know, to do most is meet with people in the field, researchers or farmers. And I think this is where we learn, learn the most because when people come out to the farm, they see my soils and say, well, you know, my soils are like that. You know, if it, if it works for you, it should work for me. Uh, I'd much rather be, you know, out in the field talking about this and showing slides, but, um, you know, we we'll dig a soil pit and our we'll full um, soil samples or, or pull up a radish and you see all the earthworms and it just amazes people because before cover crops, you know, I, didn't, I never saw earthworms in, our, in my field and, um, and now we, we know, see about, you know, four to five earthworms per square foot now in, my, in some of my fields. 
Um, all of my fields I have Barris mapped out, and this basically just shows the lighter ground and the heavier ground, and then we have reference points to each each area in the field that we can go back, so we can uh, chart this year by year to you know see you know, how are how is the soil changing over time. And you know the number one thing it used to be I used to look at the phosphorus potassium, but I really care less about even looking at that anymore. But it's mainly the organic matter. That's what I'm gonna my main thing that I look for is to see how it's improving each year. Um, I have some irrigated land, and this this picture just shows you the rye and how tall it is. You can't even see the the tires on the on the irrigation. Uh, was my success for the um, so, no-till? Wait, wait a minute, Jason. Jason, wait a minute. So, do you water your, your cover crops? No, no. Okay. I never had to. It's usually so wet during the winter, and we, we haven't ever had to. Okay. Um, so with my success for the no-till in 2014 and 15, I decided I'd unhook the subsoiler and purchase a roller crimper and got a front three-point hitch and um, went 100% no-till. Uh, some of the changes I made to the planter were I put a cutting coulter up front, the cast iron closing wheels in the back, and um, hydraulic um, precision planting uh, delta downforce and the fertilizer tanks on the top. Those we also equipped with starter fertilizer, and the fertilizer tanks are just used for weight to keep the the toolbar down. Well, I was still concerned about soil compaction, but this is a four foot tile probe and you know that's what we do when the soils are saturated. If we can go out there and push this probe down, um, we don't need the subsoil. And that's kind of our tool that we use to determine you know, if we need the subsoil or not. So before you started this, you wouldn't have been able to get that probe in the ground like that? Uh, um, unless you subsoil, you know, pushed it down where you had subsoil, but you know, between the rows, you, you couldn't. I mean, if the ground was saturated, yes, but if, it's, if the ground wasn't as mellow after as it is now, or as it was when we started with the cover crops. And like I said earlier, the earthworms, even doing no-till, you didn't see any earthworms in the field. It wasn't until we started with the cover crops. And the first year we saw about maybe one earthworm per square foot. And then it just slowly gained after that. And now today we see about four, five, six earthworms per square foot. Um, the rye here's you know real fertile area of the field with the rye six, probably pushing seven feet tall. And it can be a little scary sometimes planting into that. But um, as long as you're getting good seed to soil contact, it, we haven't had any problems uh, establishing the stand. This is my nieces, um, and you can see the field on the right. That's been planted. I think that was this field was planted in soybeans, maybe could be corn, but you can see that slight parting of the cover crop, and um, you know the crop just come on up through that. And like I said, we, we've never had any problem with getting the good stand. Um, you know, rolling down the cover crop, the rye. So what what does the rolling do for you, Jason? That 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 you feel is beneficial. Okay, so so yeah, so this this picture right here with the roller crimper has gone over it and I'm planting. So the, the roller flattens it down. You don't have any, it doesn't leave any cover crop standing. And it also helps in the termination of the cover crop. Now it's not gonna give you 100% on some things, but it, it does do a great job on the rise. But we have noticed that if we use a crimper that we can cut back on the paraquat that we use to to burn down the cover crop so we can cut back on the amount that we use when we use a roller crimper. But I, I plant all of my corn land green and that's what I'm doing here. I'm going and planting the corn at the same time. Now my soybeans and the cotton, um, we will terminate the cover crop at least three weeks, not four weeks ahead. And the reason for this, when you get into April, late April into May, if you have a cover crop growing, um, it will pull out all the moisture. It's just not enough moisture there from what I've seen um, to have an, an adequate stand. And then the test plots where we did plant green soybeans into um, green cover crop, it is a very poor stand. Um, this also eliminates any green bridge problem that you might have with the insects. So if, if you kill that cover crop ahead of time, those insects move on 
or any insects that might be coming in at the same time, if there's not a green out there, they're not going to come to that field. Jason, how much, what if pounds of residue would you have out there? How much biomass? Probably, probably dry, bio, dry biomass is probably 10,000. Okay, so back there, a couple of pictures you had uh, top of your tanks there. So just to give people an idea, that's what, about a six, eight inch mat that you're planting into? Yes, yeah, about six inches. And when it's green, of course, it's a lot. So you, Once it dries out, it, it it's it's not quite as thick, but yeah, it's just pretty yeah, thick. No, it's, it's yeah. But you don't Maybe. have any trouble. Jason. Yeah, go go ahead, Tony. W one thing with with one thing that we found with the corn, Jason was talking about rolling down green in his corn. Uh, one thing that we had to do was to roll the cover down was planting corn. We ended up with the bowl in our corn in out there, and the cover crop standing, uh, the bowl had he could hide. And he would eat all the seed and clip the corn down. So we ran into that problem one year. And so that was another reason that we always felt like you needed to roll the cover down, especially in corn. You just allowed the predator to come in and see them little rascals and they could get them, right? That, that's right. Because where the tractor wheels ran over the cover and flattened it on the ground, they they didn't mess with those rows of corn, <laughs> but everywhere else, they they <laughs> took they probably almost took fifty percent of the corn out of out of the oh, field wow. on those rows. Uh, now, now, Sonny, you're not using a, a roller crimper like designed specifically for that, like like Jason just showed. What are you What are you using to knock your cover crop down? Or are you? Maybe you are. Well, I, well, I I am, but mine's not on the front. I pull it from the behind behind it. And uh, I pull from behind. Right. Uh, now, when I what I have done in the past, like Jason said, he was burning down about two weeks ahead of his cotton. I try to do that also because he's exactly right. It'll suck the moist out the ground. <laughs> but I've been I've noticed that I've been able to take my Phillips hair and and roll my Phillips hair on dry cover and and get by and can roll it down with it it's just a wider i just my phillips hair is just is 45 foot so i can cover a little bit more ground and okay um yeah i feel like i you know, i'm rolling it down so i it that, does, it just you don't have a trouble a with bit. it bunching up on your you know on the tines and everything and then bunch up on that well it'll it'll roll up on the tines but it doesn't choke it up but now do, don't do it green <laughs> you'll be stopped <laughs> most of the time we hadn't we hadn't yeah. had a bad problem with it completely dry okay well uh doug are you do, doing a crimper or anything or rolling it or what are you doing as far as no, that, that uh, buzz was supposed to buy a lottery ticket and buy me a crimper but he never did that there you go <laughs> <laughs> no I'm, I, I'm not i'm not um Okay. I planted, I planted green and I planted after I burned down uh, in the standing cover. Um, Sonny had a problem with the voles. Um, to my knowledge, we have not. Um, so I, I have not gone. I have not gone that route. Ideally, the way Jason is set up is the way. Um, to me, looks like the. A, a wonderful way to do it, and I believe Sonny's added to his. Uh, Sonny, didn't you add something to your planner this year to basically accomplish what we're looking yeah. at on the screen now? Yes, I've, I have added an attachment, a roller on my on the front of my planner this year, so that I hope to do a one pass uh, deal this year. So, uh, so let me ask you three: How do you spray something that tall? I mean, what is there any tricks of the trade there that you've learned that you could pass on? Well, like in this picture, well, or the one where I was planting green. So when you roll it down, I have the tanks on the tractor. So I'm spraying. So the, the cover's flat on the ground and then I put the spray the paraquat on top of it. Uh, like in, in this field where I, I don't know, this sometimes I'll roll the cover crop down after it's sprayed and then come back and plant. And sometimes I've sprayed over the top and then rolled the the dead cover crop down and planted at the same time. 
But if, if you have a high clearance sprayer, you can get over the top of it, but you, you got to have something pretty tall to get over the top. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering, Jason, because that, you know, when you're that crimper pinches it like a straw, crimping a straw, does that disrupt that flow of product, you think, or down? It does a good drop, a job, it does a good job on the rod, but the, the problem is the um like clover and the vetch and most everything but the rye. It doesn't it won't do anything to it. I mean you might get a 50% kill on some, maybe a little more on some of the others, but um, I have some slides coming up where I did some organic crops and rolled two times with roller crimper and still didn't get a um, 100% kill on some stuff. But. Okay. Mm -hmm. Doug, Buzz, or Doug or Sonny, you got anything to add as far as spraying there? We, we've had no issues with killing six, seven uh, foot tall cover crops and I know one of the issues in my mind was um, pre-emerge chemicals that we used spraying it on that uh, just like on the picture we have here if uh, you're spraying a pre-emerge chemical there that prevents weeds from coming up how's that going to happen if, if you're spraying the that thatch as opposed to spraying the bare ground we never haven't seen any issue with that either uh, apparently that's just okay. works just as well so what, I mean, you, what kind of pressures are you using? Just 40, 50 pounds, you know, nothing, nothing huge. Okay, to, so, you know, not, okay. not a huge amount of pressure. Yeah. Most of the time, what we, we're anyway. trying to use, what we're trying to use, David, a lot of time we have to use a, a higher rate of water, which I think that's the way they recommend, you know, Paraquat or Gramoxone, whatever you use. Um, so just to get the coverage. Okay. So you're what, 20, 25 gallon per acre or something? 15 to 20 or gallon. Yeah. yeah, yeah we're, okay. on okay. 15, All right. yeah. we're on 15 gallons to the acre on, on everything, uh, on the burn down. <clears throat> well, let me ask this real quick and then Jason, you move on. The other presentation we had at this pigweed problem has been one of the driving forces behind adopting heavy cover crops. What what have all you what have you all seen on your own farms related to the spread or has it impacted that or was it a problem uh, even to begin with in your neck of the woods? I've got, I've got a slide coming up and maybe two more. And it shows okay. That. Okay. Gonna, Let's right. hold that question for them then. Go ahead, Jason. Keep going then. Um, the, as long as you get good seed to soil contact, I've never seen a cover crop too thick where it won't come up. Um, sometimes you hear people complaining about, well, I, I couldn't get a good stand. Well, you didn't get the seed to soil contact. The, the crop will come up through it if it's in the ground and closed up good. It will, it will make it through the residue. Uh, clean soybean fields, our herbicide program before cover crop. We two burn downs, two pre emerge and, and two post emerge. Um, today we use um, well this this past year I didn't even use any pre emerge and I just one one post emerge. So we've really cut back on our herbicides, um, on, on, especially on soybeans. And it's just due to the the thick um, mat of the a bruisey rye. And this is the, the Palmer amaranth, the pigweed. That's that's the problem. You know, before even with the two pre-emerges and two burn downs and the two post-emerge and a Roundup Ready system, we would still have to probably pull one pigweed per acre. Um, with just a Roundup Ready system today, we might still have to pull one one pigweed per ten acres. But now that we have the new Dicamba or um, two for enlist. Uh, um, really don't have any pigweed problem. And and that's all it takes right there. It's just, you can see just where it didn't get a good stand of rye and that pigweed is gonna find its way through there. There you go. So that's helped you out quite a bit then. Huh? Oh, one, one for 10 huge. acres, that must be a... The biggest savings, I mean, if you consider today, you know, we, have a lim we just have one burn down or we used to have two burn downs and then we had two pre-emerges. Well, I'm not using any pre-emerge anymore. And then we had two post emerge where we just go over one time with a one application and that's it. 
So, so let me ask you this, Jason, real quick. How long? How long does that residue? Does it stick around all uh, till next fall, or what, what? Does it decompose quickly? What, what's going on there? It will break down, but you'll notice on the rod that the, the lower parts, the the heavier, thicker part of it will it will hang on through the season into the fall. Of course, all the legumes and anything else is probably broken down by the time the, the crop canopy. So. Okay. David. Yeah, go ahead. David. Sonny. Yep. Yeah. You know, that was one thing that I I had really noticed. Um, like I said, we no-tilled for, for a long time. And uh, I was still planting in my rotation. I was planting winter wheat. And there was a number of years there we began to see uh, when we started, no, I was no-tilling wheat. And uh, we began to notice my wheat um, during the winter would get dry. If we got a dry spell, that wheat would begin to die. And so we got to going out there and looking. And what we had, we had a residue buildup so much that I could not get seed to soil contact. And uh, oh. like Jason just said, you know, you got to get the seed because we were planting wheat about an inch deep. Well, I, all my wheat seed was laying up in all that thick residue that just would not deteriorate and go away. So um, that made me go back out there, and I started having to take my subsoil. I, I went back out and started subsoiling ahead of me planting uh, the wheat in the fall. And and that eliminated a lot of my troubles, but I had a bad problem with residue. I reckon over the years, I just got thick residue. And uh, matter of fact, that's what one things I think the covers have brought. <clears throat> Mr. Ray Archuleta told us at a meeting one time, he could walk out in a field and tell us whether you had healthy soils, or unhealthy soil in, in two seconds. And that was, the, that was the thing that he could tell. If you had a buildup of residue, on the soil and that's where we were at and and you know just a light bulb came on for me when he told me that uh, uh, so i was so, having that so the build up of re- was that's because your biology wasn't working wasn't working that's quite as it. good uh, sonny you think? yes sir that's correct and i've okay. had i've not had that trouble a bit since we started planting these cover crops that 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 has gone away what? Okay, so before, oh, so you're talking about uh, residue from your corn crop, not residue from your cover crop. That's correct. All all the other crops okay. that I was growing was just building up because I weren't incorporating any any of the residue back in the ground. Um, you know, okay. and it was okay. just it was just starting to build up. So I seen the soil biology change. That took place by using cover crops. Okay. Well, let me throw this one out here, unless you're going to have a slide on this in in a minute here, Jason. If you hear this idea of carbon to nitrogen ratio, and, you know, where you got some, like you got some nice rye there that's got a real high carbon to nitrogen ratio, which means it's not going to break down very fast, as opposed to uh, cover, you know, crimson clover is going to break down. Do you all pay attention to any of that when you're choosing those species to put in your cover crop mix? Well, David, um, we 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 you, um, soybeans will be heavy with with the grasses, uh, with the with the rye, oats, etc. And uh, on the corn, we'll be as light with those grasses as possible, and and heavier with the lagoons that have a, a carbon nitrogen ratio that will be more. Uh, more suitable for a corn crop. We uh, that carbon to nitrogen ratio can tie your nitrogen up where your corn it won't be available available for that corn for um, a, a while when it really needs it up or uh, you know needs it early. So that's that's mm-hmm. a consideration when you're you're making a mix for um, you know you need to, need to be in a, in a type of a rotation with your cover crops as you are with your your cash crops. Okay. Well, on my so we farm, need to pay attention to that. Okay. Okay. 
Sonny or Jason, you got any comments related to that or? Yeah, the, the, like you said, that on the, especially on corn, yeah, you, you can, I, I've had a problem before where, you know, I only put about on corn land, I was down to about 10 pounds to the acre of just rye and I've even cut back even to five pounds to the acre. Um, you can plant that exact same pounds the next year and see a different results sometimes. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just the year or sometimes you get better germination or more tillers or, or what it is. But I've seen where even five pounds of rye to the acre on corn land can be too much. Because the problem is you go across the field and that five pounds to the acre is not enough in the light land. But then you get into some better land, old house spots, old cattle pasture or bottoms or something like that. And I think that the plant you just get a better stand, but it produces more tillers. And then the problem is it gets too thick and then it shades out the legumes. And then when you terminate it, that, that rye is just taking up so much of the nitrogen out of the soil that you can see uh, sometimes a, a um, nitrogen tie up. So, and then you have, of course, have more residue there. So you have to break down that residue. So this, this year on my corn land, I left the rye out. It's, it's gotten to be where okay. um, it was becoming a problem. Okay. Okay. Well, go ahead. Keep going on with your with your slides, there, Jason. Uh, Buzz has a question. Yeah, David. Just just one other thing. Um, when you're talking about the carbon to nitrogen ratio in cover crops, uh, you've got to keep in mind that uh, the younger the cover crop, the lower the carbon to nitrogen ratio is. So when you have a very green cover crop, typically, you know, you're going to go out there and take, you know, if it's a, a mix, you're going to have uh, anywhere between three and 5% nitrogen in the cover crop. Um, if, if that's in say uh, early to mid March, by mid to late April, you know, um, the amount of nitrogen in the cover crop will have dropped. So uh, I would, sort of hazard a guess that the carbon to nitrogen ratio is going to go from about 20 to 1 to about 40 to 1 um, from an early to later cover crop. So that is something. So when people talk about cover crop carbon to nitrogen ratios, um, don't think of it just as a fixed value. If you leave that cover crop late enough, you know, where it's all dried out, um, you know, most of that nitrogen is, is no longer there. Uh, in, in, you know, it's been taken up. So um, that's just something you want to keep in mind. It's, it's a dynamic property rather than a static property. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point there, Buzz. Good point. So, okay. Well, keep going there, Jason. So, yep. Yeah. Also, we noticed real clean cornfields uh, where we used to have to use two quarts of atrazine to the acre. We've cut that down to just one quart. Um, like I said, you want to have some grass out there. You want to shade the ground with those um, with a rye or grass type cover crop because it it holds back the weeds and and, and mulches it for the hold hold the moisture in. But you want you don't want too much. You want you want the legumes to really grow. Um, and that's sometimes a problem later on. I notice if I have a, a, a grass in the, in the cover crop like the rye and you have the balance just right, you don't have any problems with the, the morning glory late in the season because you can have good weed control but then here the corn comes start to, to dry down and then here comes the morning glory growing up the, the corn plant and then it causes problems with harvest. Fire was always a big concern that I had. You just have 10,000 pounds of dry biomass out there. I was always worried someone was gonna throw a cigarette out or a lightning strike would catch the field on fire. And I never thought that our local police department and our military would set my field on fire by setting off an explosive. <laughs> but they were doing a training exercise on, on our road. Farm. And I guess they thought that this was part of the oh, training man. exercise to, set the farmer's field on fire and they could have easily put it out um, with 50 people out there and each vehicle having a fire extinguisher, but they just kept on with their exercise and that turned into that. And the bad thing about it, it was the dead center of the CIG Buzz's research plot. And it pretty much destroyed the whole plot oh, yeah. and um, the results. And we, we always joked and said it was the 
chemical company or the fertilizer company sabotaged us, but but you couldn't have picked out of 500 acres, you couldn't have picked the worst spot to burn 15 acres of, and it was right in the center of it. <laughs> Did you get compensated for that loss, sir? It, you know, it, it took it exactly a year to get my money back from them, and I had to go there and had to document everything, and it was the biggest pain, and they paid me for exactly what I lost down to the penny, and it was nothing for my time or anything else, and I, I never want to have to go through that ever again. <laughs> mm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but when you have yeah. cover crops, you're going to have the wildlife, and, and you're going to have <laughs> deer antlers. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> And this happens probably once a year, either the tractors or piece of equipment picks up a um, deer antler. And when you're planting huge game patches is all they are. The deer love it and they just spend all their time out there. And what was so bad about this is these tires were brand new. They were put on the day before. And I yeah. drove over this, this oh, antler. Oh, man. And um, I found the other antler just, just 20 feet away from that. But um, yeah, I had to put a tube in that brand new tire and that was sickening. But the landlords love it, you know, especially if they're deer hunters, because they it just attracts the wildlife. Um, I mean, uh, 2015, we went through one of the worst. At the time, it was the worst drought I've ever seen. Um, where farmers around me were were not harvesting the crop down, we were able to cut 75 bushels of corn. Now, you know, you're not going to come out on 75 bushel of corn, but that shows you, and you see the residue there. I had a real thick rye cover crop out here, and it showed and it held the moisture, and it just shows you what, you know, no till and, and residue, what it can do. We did make 75 bushel of corn. Hmm. That same year, 2015, we had the worst flood I've ever seen. Wow. Um, <laughs> Or in 24 hours, we had 20 inches of rain. And I had all the corn land planted in cover crop. Um, soybeans weren't harvested. And anyone that had tilled land around me, their fields had you know, pretty much washed away. Um, we were able to, um, these beans right here, we were able to actually get out there and, and combine it. Like Sonny was saying earlier, since we hadn't subsoiled three weeks after that, now not down in that bottom, but on this hill, we were able to get out there and I harvested, you know, 95% of my soybean crop that year. But now it did have a lot of damage, sprout damage, and it was, was in bad shape. We were able to get it out. Tried organic corn, just experimenting with some test plots for two years. And you can see the field's <laughs> nice and clean. Um, I, really, I didn't go out here and pull any weeds. And you, you can see just having that thick rye cover crop um, that it, it held back the weeds. Now we did have some legumes in the mix. Um, we we rolled it twice, but um, we did see some problems where the cover crop, the legumes lived through the rolling and they did pull a lot of moisture out and did cause some stand loss and probably some yield loss. Did the same thing two years. We tried some organic soybeans and had real good luck with the, with the soybeans, but um, you know, I was worried that pigweed was going to be the problem, but the strangest thing, the, the weed that popped through all that was the mare's tail. Now, that's a real problem that weed that we have when we're growing conventional beans, but in the organic system, the, the mare's tail in some areas did pop through on the organic soybeans. After the severe flooding um, in 2016, we saw some yield loss due co to compaction. Um, so in 2017, we hooked the subsoiler back and went back to subsoiling um, where we were seeing you know, five to six earthworms per square foot. We went back to zero. So I think our biology was drowned and destroyed because um, the soil stayed saturated for 30 days. And I think it just killed a lot of the um, beneficial microbes and the earthworms we had in the soil. What was so bad when I planted this field, uh, the same tractor that I've been using the same rig on when I subsoiled for, for 10 years, I could barely pull it across the field because the, the ground was so hard. So the following year, I had to buy a larger tractor to, um, not this tractor, but another tractor to um, be able to pull the subsoiler because the ground just got so hard. This is just a picture of the, um, showing towards the end of the cover crop planting, how you'll start to see the clover start to bloom, but this is right at the end of the 
planting season on corn. But it, going back with subsoiling, it was just, I didn't like the, too much soil disturbance. I don't want to see the, that bare soil there. Um, this is a neighbor's field that I planted for them. And this is just winter weeds um, and rolled and, and planted right into it. And I tell a lot of people, if they're not going to plant a cover crop, just let the winter weeds grow. You better doubt to have something green growing out there versus a, a bare mm -hmm. field. And um, he made great corn and there were some rye and, um, and vetch and that just naturally was out there in the field and made a, a, a great crop. Just a shot of the soybeans and, and the rye as they're growing. And then in 20, um, 2018, I added, um, removed the, the closing coulters behind the subsoiler shank and went with these rubber press wheels. And then on the planter, um, still running the row cleaners, but now I'm not running the row cleaners all the way down in the ground. They're, they're lifted up pretty high. They just, a lot of times you can look back and they're not even in, touching the ground. They're mainly there just to kick the radish out of the way because if we don't get cold enough during the winters, the radish will lift through. And if you run over it with the, the gauge wheel on the planter, it kind of bounces over it. But those, having the row cleaners there, they'll just kick this radish out of the way. And then I have the spike closing wheels on the back of the planter. And this is what that rig looks like. You, you don't see as much soil disturbance, but I'm pulling the, you know, the subsoil through the field. And, and this is on the new, newer tractor that doesn't have the roller crimper on the front. So it, a lot of people think you have to have a roller crimper and you don't. It, it, I had a great stand. I like to see the rye or, or the cover crop flat on the ground, um, but it's not 100% necessary. And um, you know, always had a good stand doing it this way. Uh, the soybeans coming up through the rye, and believe it or not, this is actually subsoiled and planted. It looks like straight no-till, but it was subsoiled and, and, and planted, and you very minimum disturbance with the subsoil if it's set up right. In 2018, that was my first year planting cotton, and I was very nervous about it. Um, thick rye crop, uh, went into it, really didn't have a whole lot of problems planting. Um, but I did bump my population up because I thought the rye was just going to be too thick. And actually, every seed came up and actually had the cotton a little bit too thick. <laughs> but the, uh, the cotton came on up and it, it looked great. This was the Liberty um, dicamba cotton, but we never sprayed any Liberty or dicamba over the top of it. We just sprayed gl uh, gl glyphosate. Um, Might have been a few pigweed here and there, but it wasn't anything to worry about. And we pulled those and... Um, I think on the glyphosate, was two applications. I think the first one was only 16 ounces, and the, the second time it was only 20 ounces. And we did use Valor pre-emerge, so had a pretty low cost in our um, herbicide program just because we had that thick rye cover crop. 2020, um, Unferth came out with a roller crimper that mounts on the front of the subsoiler, and I tried this last year, and, and it worked pretty good. Um, I still, that way I can still get the benefits of the roller crimper. And instead of having that roller crimper on the front of the tractor, which is a great place to put it, but it's fine when you're in the field, but going down the road with all that weight on the front of it, all you're worried, you're worried it's just gonna come off or something's gonna happen, but putting it on the, on the subsoiler, you feel a lot more comfortable with it back there. All right, this is the, the hedgerow what, going through what? the center. This show, that is the property line. So south of that is the neighbor's field north of that are my field uh, so to the left is my neighbor's field and to the right is my field um, same soil type just different management practices and you can see the difference in the soil uh, about a one to one and a half percent difference in the organic matter and it's just due to diversity in the cover crops and different practices over the years versus um, the left just being heavy tillage and about three crops planted in my lifetime that I've seen out there. Um, after corn harvest, um, we'll come in probably the first of November and, and plant the cover crop, but you know we, we're harvesting corn the first of August. So we have about 30 to 60 days, uh, depending on when we finished, where the land just sits out and it's just brown and there's nothing going on out there. So what we started doing in the past couple of years is planting a summer cover crop after the corn crop. And then also last year, I started back growing wheat and instead of growing soybeans after the wheat crop, we're growing a 
cover crop, a, a summer cover crop after the wheat crop. And a lot of people didn't understand why I was doing that. And um, uh, I think that this is gonna benefit my land more than planting a soybean crop because I think I can build my organic matter up a lot faster this way. And we had real good luck with you know doing this. And in this picture, I'm just rolling the cover crop down. I'm not planting anything at the time, but I'm just rolling it down so I could come back and plant later on. And this so you'll plant back. another cover crop into this, Jason? That's right. So in, in this picture, I'm planting um, the winter wheat. And I, I got the roller crepper on the front, but it's not necessarily doing anything. I just had it on there. So, I'm, so, I'm, so I've rolled this cover, summer cover crop down that was planted after corn. And now I'm plant, I rolled it down and we've had a frost and it's killed the, the summer cover crop. Now I'm planting, no-till planting the, the wheat into the um, summer cover crop. And you can see the wheat emerging through all that residue. And anywhere that I planted wheat into the summer cover crop this year is my best looking wheat. I thought it was gonna be some nitrogen tied up, even though I did have some legumes in there, but it is the best looking wheat. It was easy to plant into, it was mellow. Um, I really think you could have gone out there with a conventional grain drill and planted into it. The soil was just so mellow. In the fields where I planted wheat into just corn stubbles, the ground was hard. It just didn't didn't have the good color. It just didn't look as good. So I'm going to do this every year from now on 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 where I'm going to be planting wheat. And this is planting um, winter cover crop into the summer cover crop. So we have corn land that was planted into uh, a summer cover crop. Now we're coming back and planting winter cover crop into the summer cover crop. And I've had mixed results. I've been doing this for two or three years now. Um, we thought in the past that maybe because it's so dry that time of year that the cover crop was pulling up a lot of the moisture and we weren't getting a good stand on the winter cover crop. But this past year, we had adequate moisture and we're not seeing as good a stand at, on the uh, winter cover crop. And so what we might do is leave some of the larger species, um, like the sorghum Sudan, we might leave that out and probably put some shorter growing plants or more shorter growing plants like um, buckwheat or something like that. Maybe it's a shading problem or tying up in nutrients, but there's something going on where it's affecting the, um, the winter cover crop stand. And, and the whole goal here is to increase biomass. That's right. Trying to plant, always have something green growing, feeding the microbes and hoping to increase our organic matter. And my cover crop mix for that I have planted now that we'll be planting corn into right now. This year, I left the rye out and went with a triticale, um, just five pounds of that and five pounds of oats. And another problem we would sometimes run into with having rye since we're applying, and I might've talked about this earlier, was the rye would get so tall that you had to get the, um, the chicken litter out by February. If you got into mid-February, the, the rye was getting so tall that you couldn't get a good spread. So with the, with the triticale and the, and the oats, they don't get so tall and you can still spread. Um, winter peas, 20 pounds, radish, a half a pound. And that's all we need. Half a pound of radish is plenty. We used to put two pounds out, it's, it gets too thick. Uh, clover, one pound, uh, vetch, six, and threw in flax this year for the first time, two pounds. And then on our summer mixes, what we planted after wheat, um, you see that list of everything in this, that's a lot of diversity, not much on the pounds per acre there. And so probably gives you on a summer mix, you have probably a lot more different species that you can plant. So what, what's the cost of this, Jason? My average cost is probably $25, probably for each one on, on that. That summer mix, we might be pushing $30 on that. And my fertility on corn, uh, we put one and a half to two tons of chicken litter per acre. Um, and then we'll, we'll, right before planting, we'll broadcast 50 pounds of nitrogen, or three quarters of that being slow release ESN product. And then if it's irrigated land, we'll put out um, 40 pounds of nitrogen through the irrigation. So, on our corn fertility, all our nitrogen, majority of it's coming from the chicken litter, the cover crop, and then all we're, the re remainder of our nitrogen is just coming from that 50 pounds 
of um of the end and if it's irrigated 40 more pounds so uh, we can cut depending on if we get the rainfall you know we can do anywhere from 150 to 175 bushel dry land corn and then irrigated 200 to 225. Um, cotton one to two tons of chicken litter per acre and then 30 to 50 pounds of in half of that being slow release Soybeans, we, we quit about five years ago for uh, fertilizing soybeans, didn't see any economic gain on it. And then wheat, uh, two tons um, right before planting, and then we put out 40 pounds of uh, 25S in. Um, that we, I just put out some just the other day to finish out the wheat. And the changes I've made over the past nine years, um, I'm into my ninth year right now. So this, the cover crop that I'm going to plant into this year is my ninth cover crop that I've had. Um, you know, 100% cover crop on every acre. I've eliminated all granular phosphorus and potassium. I haven't put any out in six, seven years now. Um, I've reduced insecticides by 70%. I've reduced herbicides by 50%, if not more. Um, I've reduced fungicides by 95%, and we, you know, we're not spraying any fungicide, but there is still a fungicide on the, the seed treatment. Um, you know, I'm planting everything no-till or minimum till, and I have some fields that have no lime in, in eight years, and I don't see, you know, our, our pH is, is either the same or has gone up, with, and we haven't put out um, any lime on some of these fields in eight years, and I don't see ever applying any more lime. Again, and you know, lime's $36 a ton. We were, you know, splitting it and probably putting it out every other year, putting out a ton maybe per acre. And then you have to do the variable rate and the soil sampling on that right there by itself almost pays for your cover crop seed. And then plans for this year is to grow some of my own cover crop seed. I can grow some of the rye or the triticale or the um, soybeans. Um, and I'm gonna do some test trials with untreated corn seed. I did some of this last year and kind of had some mixed results. Anywhere that we had the naked seed where we went through a, a bottom that was saturated or, or was wet over the winter, there was a stand loss, but anywhere that was on land that, that didn't get submerged over the winter, um, didn't see any difference in the yield. What we're gonna do this year is have some um, corn seed that's untreated some with the full treatment, and we're going to have some that we bought untreated that we're just going to put a fungicide on it because it's so hard to get a corn seed with just a fungicide. They're always going to be want to put the neonics on it, and I think we can get by with without the neonics on the, on the corn seed. We might can, you know, just have to um, treat it ourselves and put the fungicide on it. But I want to get 100% away from insecticides, um, and we're. Planting 50% of the corn this year non-GMO. We had good luck last year with non-GMO corn. And if everything works out next year, well, I think we'll be 100% non-GMO on the corn. Um, we're gonna graze cattle this year on cover crops, a partnership Buzz and I are working on. We, we've talked about it too long. It's something we've been talking about for the past two years. And I think it's really the missing piece of the puzzle is to get the cattle back on the land. Uh, we're gonna start pretty small with it and, and have another farmer in the, in the county where we can get his cows and bring them in um, late summer into the fall and uh, graze some stockers for maybe three months. And then Buzz is gonna keep up with all this information um, at the gains and in the soil and you know see what, what the benefits are bringing the cattle back on the land. Um, eliminating gl glyphosate completely. Uh, we know it's a chelator. Uh, we know it's antibacterial. But really, we just don't need it anymore. I mean, it, it, it's got a bad name, and I'm just going to eliminate it completely off off the farm. We just don't need it anymore, and and we know that we definitely know some of the problems that it is causing. Um, and I want to eliminate insecticides. I'm at the point now, if if it's a crop that I got to spray with insecticide, I just don't want to grow it anymore. And I know soybean prices look great this year, and everybody's um, excited about planting beans. I'm not going to plant any soybeans this year after wheat or any full season beans, except for the beans that I'm planting for seed that I'm going to save on non-GMO soybeans for my cover crop seed for, for next year. Um, and then the small 10 or 15 acres that I'm planting for seed, I'm going to experiment with some sugars and trying to get the bricks levels up and try to figure out how, and this is something that Buzz and I worked on last year, how we can increase those bricks levels and, and 
have a healthy plant that will protect itself from the insects. Insects. Once I can master that, I'll maybe go back to growing um, some soybeans. But the insect pressure has gotten so bad, and I'm at the point now where I, I just don't want to spray any insecticides. I don't want to be exposed to it, and I don't want it, you know, on my land, knowing what the problems it could do to the to the soil. And this is my last slide, and this is a picture of my nieces, and they're 10 and 13 years old now. So they grew up, you know, seeing my regenerative agriculture, and that's all they know. And hopefully one day they'll they'll might want to farm, and and we're out here counting earthworms, and that's something they still like to do to today is just go out and see see how many earthworms we can find or find the largest radish. And that that's the end of my slides. Okay. Jason, that's really good. I appreciate that. I appreciate the comments coming in from, from uh, Sonny and from uh, Doug here. And before we move on to Archie, I had a couple questions. Buzz, I'm going to throw this one out to you. Maybe you, since you're the scientist amongst us, I'll put you on the spot. I had a question about what happens to the nitrogen related to the to tying up in the, in the cereal rye. Yeah, you know, where 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 does it go? You know, maybe you can talk a little bit about mineralization, mobilization, and then I got a question about what's your thoughts on why the pH is stabilized? You know, six seven years, you would think over time, especially. Well, just what's your thoughts on that? So go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I, the um, you know, I um, my understanding is that. Uh, for instance, when you've got a, a rye cover crop, I remember some of those parts of the rye, like the, the leaves, for instance, are going to decompose a little bit quicker. They tend to have a lower carbon, a, a, a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. So the, the tie up then basically happens in the plant, um, in the plant microbes. So if you look, uh, you know, our understanding of soil organic matter improves all the time. And of course, when we use the measurement of soil organic matter, it's a real blunt instrument. I think we're getting better at sort of distinguishing between uh, what is coming from dead plant matter and how much of that soil organic matter is made up of microbes. But uh, uh, the, the, the plant microbes are first at the table. And so basically those microbes are gonna um, utilize that nitrogen um, as the plant gets a little bit older. Um, and then it becomes unavailable. Um, to mineralize it, those, those microbes then have to be consumed. Uh, you, can, you can easily mineralize uh, the microbes by just going over with a, a, a tillage instrument and release a lot of carbon dioxide and a lot of nitrate into the soil. But uh, what we're really trying to do is um, we look at uh, um, bacteria and fungi as little bags of fertilizer uh, because their um, uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio is somewhere around three to one. And by reducing uh, tillage, reducing physical and chemical uh, disturbance, uh, we're trying to increase our concentration of uh, nematodes and protozoans. Remember, most nematodes are actually good nematodes, nematodes that eat uh, um, fungi, bacteria, and then root exudates, um, as well as other nematodes. So pest nematodes, which are plant eaters, are only present when you've got monocultures and sick plants, their job is to eliminate uh, um, pests. But the nematodes and the protozoans consume, uh, they're like the lions in the Serengeti, they're gonna consume your bacteria and fungi. So you want those guys to be uh, eating your bacteria and fungi right next to the root, uh, right next to the root in the rhizosphere and make those nitro that nitrogen available. Um, keep in mind when you roll down your cover crop and you've got that residue on the surface, the carbon to nitrogen ratio on the surface is gonna be very high, but in the soil itself, that carbon to nitrogen ratio, um, you know, the purported tie up that we talk about is not always there. Uh, the second thing um, that we do talk about that you asked me is, um, the hypothesis that I have is that um, 
prior to using cover crops, um, we had a lot of nitrate nitrogen in the system. Um, and the nitrate nitrogen, um, basically when it's taken up by the plant, the plant will um, exude a, um, a, a nitrate nitrogen is an anion. So it's negatively charged. And the plant will exude a negatively charged ion, usually OH minus, which will combine with the uh, H plus ion. Um, we think that um, when people applied excess nitrogen fertilizer, uh, that uh, the nitrates actually leached out below the root zone, leaving a lot of hydrogen ions um, behind, which then would raise, uh, raise the acidity or reduce your pH. So what we hypothesize is that with the cover crops, they are recycling the nitrate, nitrate nitrogen before it leaves the root zone and therefore have been able to maintain and in, in some cases increase the pH. Okay, thanks Buzz. And James, I'm gonna ask you two or three quick questions and then I wanna move on to Archie. Is If you're gonna eliminate glyphosate, what are you going to use to terminate your cover crop? Oh, so during the burn down, we use um, uh, Paraquat. So we, so we roll and, and, okay. and that's kind of what we've always used. Okay. And do you get a premium for your non-GMO corn? No. No. Um, okay. I haven't, haven't found any local markets that, you know, willing to pay. But I'm not, okay. on some of the varieties, we're just not seeing any yield difference. Um, and some of the varieties that we're planting, um, we, we've even experimented with some of the hybrid 85, uh, $85 a bag, might as well say $99 by the time you pick it up. Um, $99 a bag versus a bag that's $250. Yeah, the $250 bag yields more, but when you factor in the, um, the difference in the cost per bag, you're actually better off with the cheaper corn. So, and it's the kind of the same thing I've seen with the non-GMO corn. It's just cheaper and it, you're not making any more money with the, 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 the GMO corn. Okay. Well, it's all about putting money in your pocket. That's right. Okay. Uh, there's a question in there, and I'm hoping Archie can handle this one through his presentation. But it was about uh, the question about the profitability between and using cover crops versus the benefits. You know, there's a cost and benefit ratio thing going. So Archie's going to kind of address that with his uh, economic analysis of Sonny's farm. So Archie, I'm gonna let you share your screen and go through your findings and uh, we'll go from there. Um, we have seen some interesting information. Now we want to move in and, and focus on some economic uh, results that we, we do have. And the, what we wanna do is ask the question, is there a business case for farmers adopting soil health management systems? In other words, do soil health management systems increase farm profitability? To do that, we'll look at the costs and benefits. And we note that incremental production changes due to adoption of the soil health management systems affect four components of farm profitability. Let's note the word incremental because when you adopt the soil health management system, it's not a complete overhaul from a conventional system. It's just some selected changes that are incremental. So the four components of farm profitability that are affected are, number one, there could be reduced expenses as a benefit. If you go from conventional till to no till, the very first thing that happens is you eliminate all the expenses that are associated with tilling fuel, labor, and usage of the equipment. Another potential benefit is additional revenue. If your yields increase due to the soil health management system, you would uh, receive higher revenue. But also when you adopt the soil health management system, you will have some additional expenses that it will be a cost. For example, if you plant cover crops, you do have to purchase the cover crop seed. And then also, if you uh, do realize a reduction in yield, this would be another cost that be reduced revenue. So we determine the cost and benefits by taking the summation of the two benefits, one or two, and subtracting the summation of the cost, which are three or four, 
And this is the net impact of the production change due to adopting a soil health management system. To do this, we do partial budget analysis. And partial budget analysis results or changes in net farm income, not absolute levels. Just keep in mind that the numbers that we will review today are changes due to the soil health management systems. They're not the absolute change at the farm level. We do have more information about the partial budget analysis that we use in all our analysis at the Soil Health Institute at this website. So we visited with Sonny and we got the um, field activities that are involved in adopting the soil health management system. On the left of this presentation are the reduced field activities and inputs. Uh, for example, if you're in conventional till and you go to no-till, you have all these reductions in expenses. Sonny was disking, subsoiling, and then disking again and using a regular planting. Then after that, after the um, cotton was planted, he would have two applications of dicamba, and these were the fertilizers that he was um, putting out on the cotton crop. Um, and then in the conventional system, after the cotton was harvested, um, he would mow the stalks. Um, let me note that when we visited with Sonny, we collected the same information for all the crops that he grows, corn, cotton, and soybeans, but today we're just going to present the results for cotton. So on the left, these are all the things that um, Sonny no longer does because he's adopted a soil health management system and no-till and cover crops. So on the other side, we have the additional field activities and inputs. Uh, Sonny plants his cover crop. He put, has uh, rigged up an air seeder on his Phillips harrow. And so when he's um, uh, using this uh, implement, he's also planting his cover crop seed. This cover crop seed mix that he uses are, are listed here. And this cover crop um, seed mix costs $22 per acre. So it's planted in the fall. And then after it grows uh, throughout the winter and in the spring, he burns it down with two pints of bromoxone. Then after it's sprayed, he comes in with his roller crimper, crimps it down, and then he uses a no-till planter to come in and to plant into the cover crop residue. And note that Sonny in his no-till cover crop system was on all his crops, including cotton, he has increased his seeding rate by 10%. So this is an additional cost by use, from using the no-till cover crop system. And then after this planted during the season, he uses two spray applications of Enlist. So we do the analysis of this, and this is what we come up with at the, um, the partial budget results showing the change in net farm income due to adopting the no-till cover crops. Let's go on down to the bottom and, and look at the yield. Sonny told us, and you know, he mentioned it during his presentation, that he's not really seeing any increased yield due to this system, but he is not seeing any decreased yield. So the, the revenue portions of the analysis are, are no change in revenue. So these are the, the values on, for the reduced expenses that we looked at in the previous slide. The fertilizer uh, component is $89.91 that Sunny has reduced. Um, the chemical herbicides that we saw were $8.48 in reduction. And the equipment cost for not doing those tillage activities is $31.50. And these other items, the fuel and the labor, are going to be associated with this equipment uh, ownership costs that we've calculated. So the total reduction in expenses is $157.14. Likewise, on the other side, we have additional costs. The, the cover crop seed uh, we saw was uh, $22 per acre, but the increased seeding rate for the cotton makes the total additional seed expense $33 per acre. Those two spray applications of the list that we looked at are $33 and one cent. And then the um, activity of, of planting the cover crop 
and using the, the no-till um, planter and terminating the cover crop and using the roller crimper, the uh, equipment ownership cost of that is $16.55. And these fuel and labor charges uh, are expenses that are associated with this. So the total additions are $94.41 in expenses. So if we look at, uh, we take a comparison of reduced expenses and the additional expenses, we see that the reduced expense amount is $62.67 greater than the additional expense. So the adoption of this soil health management system has increased net farm income to $62.67 just with the change in expenses, uh, no, no increased yields. So now we want to go back and look at these field activities that, that led to this uh, increase in net farm income. And let's give Sonny a chance to, to comment on some of these. And probably um, the, the first place to start would be with the cover crop, um, how you plant the cover crop, Sonny, with you put, you rig this up yourself, you put an air seeder on a, a Phillips harrow. So, it's likely that this cover crop seed, you're putting that with the Phillips Hera and it's incorporating it into the soil. Would you comment about this cover crop seed mix and, and how you're planting it? Yes. Uh, yeah, we, you, we're probably using about a six-way mix on our winter cover of crop mix there. Um, and like I say, the bigger problem we had was trying to get figure out how to get the seed in in a timely fashion and so um when we got the philip terror that was we were at one time throwing it all out with a my fertilizer truck uh but we got bought this air seeder and put on the philip terror and uh it's really worked beautifully i was able then to cut the seed rate back also by not having to throw it in out in a truck and it just kind of air seeder just puts it right on top of the ground and the Phillips hair comes and incorporates it in just a little bit that need much incorporation. Uh, so it tiptoes across the Phillips hair, tiptoes across the ground there a little bit. And, and uh, we get some seed to soil contact there. So we were able to run this Phillips hair. Doesn't take much horsepower tractor to pull it. So that, that means a lot. Uh, so don't burn up a lot of fuel. And uh, plus, like I say, you can you run that thing, you know, 10, 11 miles an hour through the field. So you cover a lot of ground in a day. And so that was a, a really big plus for us. Let's say that uh, corn was the previous crop. Uh, about what months would you come in and, and plant this cover crop if you're going to have cotton next year? Well, if we were doing corn, what I usually do behind all my corn is I plant a summer cover like Jason did. And uh, and then most of the time behind all of my corn land, I plant I still plant wheat. So I would usually uh, come in and uh, plant my summer cover, and then I plant wheat behind behind it, really. So most of the, most of the time, I'm, uh, um, I'm planting cotton in behind a lot of... Uh, probably soybean land, mm -hmm. uh, Archie. So that's, I come in with the cedar then and, and, and plant that way. Okay. So th this cover crop would be planted probably about in October? Yeah. After, soy, after soybeans? Yeah, right. After we get through the harvest on soybeans starting to cut, well, it'll probably be over in October. Um, uh, Basically, sometime in October, and we'll start um, cover cropping all the wheat land. And then when I pick cotton off, I'll be picking cotton at the same time. So we can, we usually keep the field terror pretty busy and the cedar <laughs> pretty busy. But I have to yeah. switch back and forth and catch up with the combines, and I go back over to the picker and get behind that and and put the cover crop out. So it keeps me keeps me where I can keep. Um, get all the winter cover planted, you know, most of the time in a pretty timely fashion. And that's key getting the cover in the winter cover. Yes, that's, that's key getting it planted quick as possible. 
Okay, so let's look over here at these reduced fertilizers. How long did it, how many years did it take you to realize these reductions before you could cut back on nitrogen by about 20 pounds and eliminate K and then eliminate the, the lime application each year? How, how long did it take before you realized that? Well, I reckon you could call me the dumb one out the crowd. <laughs> so I, we, when we started this, and like I said, the uh, the SIG field, we had cut nitrogen rates back on cotton in that particular field. We had cover crop there before I ever planted the cotton that year. And so we ended up cutting back the the nitrogen levels on that cotton. Uh, we we done, in, I think we done K and P, but uh, we cut back on nitrogen. And uh, like I say, we even put, planted some of that field. We didn't have zero nitrogen on the cotton in a, in a plot. And uh, I think it picked 900 and something pound that year uh, with zero nitrogen. So we, when we started going with cover crop, we we went a little crazy. I, we just kind of went whole hog. We didn't cut any nitrogen rates out. But our P and K, our, our, our phosphorus, I should say, uh, we cut it completely out when we started um, because of what the soil sampling we had checked. Uh, we just seen that our phosphorus levels, I think, over the years, <laughs> I reckon with all the, the so-called maintenance uh, fertilizer we were putting out there, our phosphorus levels will build up in our land pretty pretty significantly anyway so we just completely cut out phosphorus right at the get-go two years later we ended up cutting the potash out and now we're trying to tweak the end rates now so um like i say on my cotton crop this past year we didn't use about which we used a chicken litter we used two ton of chicken litter but then we didn't use but about 25 units of in to my cotton crop this year. So uh, it had a, well, like I say, we, we had a fairly decent cotton crop. I'd say we, I think overall our cotton acres, we still, we came in above the state average. I believe what state average of our, ours was probably, I think it was like 25, 30 pounds more in the state average so we were right at 800 pounds this year uh, across the board what i caught at 25 you know pounds of, of in and two tons of chicken litter so uh without any p k the lime the lime like i say we just uh, like jason we just have not seen our uh our phs go down hardly um, they they kind of stabilized, and uh, we do have a few farms that we pick up every now and again, you know pick up and has been conventional farming, and we've stayed with this same program going there, and do, we do see a yield hit when we do that. I, I think from now on, if I get another farm that's been conventional tilled, I need to I need to stay back with some potash and some phosphorus. And, go back up with my nitrogen rates, but uh, it's just kind of hard to end up setting everything up one way and then changing up. So we just kind of take those farms and do them the same way, but we do take a yield hit for about three three crops, and then you start seeing things change around. Right. Yeah, that, that's, that's one thing we pick up from farmers who have adopted no till and cover crops, and they do take up new rental land. It takes a while for them to make it recover. They have to do some work with it because it's been the way they usually put it, it's been abused by, by tillage. So, just like you said, <laughs> it, it takes a while to, for them to get it back, get it where they want it. Now, yes, sir. Um, in, um, in the cotton, you, you told us that you no longer mow your your stalks after the cotton crop. What is it about the no-till cover crop system that, that's associated with no longer mowing the cotton stalks? Well, once I go out there with my my Phillips hair, it 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 kind of chews up some of the most of the cotton stalks. I still have stalks standing, 
Uh, but mm-hmm. once I put my winter cover out, uh, I said, well, why do I need to be mowing stalks? Uh, I'll just leave them standing and run the Phillips hair out there in it and knock them, most of them down. It doesn't look mm-hmm. pretty, but uh, as soon as the cover crops get up above, you know, grows off, you can't see them anyway. And by the time I come back in spring to plant corn or or if I had to plant some cotton behind them, that they're no problem. They're so brittle. Uh, they just collapse and fall apart. So it saved, that has saved me from having the most stalks. I see. Okay, so you're just getting two things done at one time when you're planting your cover crops with the Philip Hera. That, uh, that's correct. Yes, sir. Now, uh, over on, on the other side about the additional expenses, you you told us that you have increased your seeding rate 10% for cotton, but I remember you also said that about all the other crops, too. When you went to no-till and cover crops, you increased your seeding rate at planting a little bit. Could you talk about that some? Well, we just, that was started long ago, and I, I'm like Jason. I think I can cut some of that rates back after our soil has gotten to uh, where it's getting to um, because of the compaction levels and how hard the soil is. When we first started no-tilling, everybody told you they need to raise your seeding rate up about 10%. So that's kind of where we went with that seeding rate on every, you know, all our crops. Um, but like I say, uh, I think I can start cutting back on some of that, or that's my goal, uh, maybe cut back on some of my seeding rates uh, because I just I just feel like my the tilt in my land is a lot better. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, we had a lot of residue by no-tilling. We had a lot of residue built up on the land, and uh, so that was another reason I increase that seeding rate because I just weren't getting good soil uh, seed contact. Right. <clears throat> okay, so we look at the, the herbicide comparisons. It's typically when you go from conventional till to no-till, you do have uh, an increase in herbicide expenses. So you have, um, for two sprays, you have stopped using the dicamba for two sprays, but you've added the Enlist, which is a more expensive herbicide. Do you have any anticipation that in the future you, you may be able to cut back on one or both of these Enlist applications due to the cover crop and roller crimping it down? I'm, I'm hoping we are as soon as we can get this, you know, get the, the pigweed seed bank under control and that's right. that's our goal is uh i'd let i'm like jason i'm 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 trying to look at about trying to cut out insecticide and as much herbicide as i can possibly do fungicides and all and uh i i, I just think some of that stuff it takes a little time but i think it's a achievable goal okay Okay, so one more time, we'll, we'll take a look at the, the final net income increase, $62.67, just from reduction in expenses. And Sonny just said there might be more to come in the future. Some of these uh, herbicide costs might be able to be also reduced, so we have an additional increase in net farm income. Well, Sonny, we appreciate the opportunity to visit with you several months ago. We appreciate all the good information that you gave us to allow us to do this analysis for cotton and all your other crops. So we appreciate it. Okay, Arch, you will. Okay, David, I'm going to turn it back over to you, and we'll take any, okay. any more questions if we have any. Okay. What? Yeah, we're almost out of time here, but I do want to ask a question. I know, Sonny and Jason, this probably applies to you. You had a comment come in about the impact and use of uh, poultry litter on your line. I'm just kind of curious how often you a field gets poultry litter. Is that every year, every other year? And then your thoughts on that as far as yeah, that seemed like a, a good trade off. So any any comments related to that? Well, the Doplop poultry litter every year. Um, and we used to do some base two tons across every acre. But we've been cutting back on that. Like we're, we put a, a ton and a half on most of the corn land this year and um and putting two tons on on wheat land but i'm probably going to cut that back to uh, a ton and a half and on 
some of the better land, the land that's been in the, the regenerative agriculture for nine years now, um, I might even cut some of that back to one ton and, and maybe even start putting it so in were, a little bit earlier. Were you still lying? How long were you applying chicken litter before you started your system? And were were you having to lime if you were in addition to that? Yeah, so, so I've been putting chicken litter out for 15 years, maybe. So yeah, before before you know cover crops, yeah, we we put two tons of chicken litter out and variable rate applied phosphorus, potassium, and and the nitrogen and limed every other year, and it's just you know cut cut back on cut out all the phosphorus, potassium, and the lime. Okay, what about you, Sonny? Well, I hadn't been putting chicken litter out for probably about you know probably about five years now. So um, we're putting out two ton across every acre we got. The main reason I'm trying to use the chicken litter too, I know I'm getting all my nutrients, a lot of nutrients, but I'm just wanting mm -hmm. to try to build up my organic matter quickly as possible. So my plans is maybe I can start cutting back on the chicken litter, you know, in another few few years and maybe do it every other year. I, I, I can't, I need to talk to Jason. I, I can't get the fella that does my chicken litter. He's, he wants to put, he really wants to put out more than two tons, but <laughs> uh, yeah, he wants yeah, to get rid might. of that stuff. But yeah. Yeah, he wants but, to uh, put it out of ten, but it's, ten it's, times of the acre, been, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I think we got more chicken litter than we do land. But, uh, uh so, uh, it, 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 but it's, it's, it, it's an amazing thing. I just, I just can't say enough about the cover crops. And I think that's, Lord, I just don't know what we could have, where we could have been at if we'd have been using cover crops when I started no-tilling in the eighties. I just, mm. it's just been amazing now to see where, where we'd be at. So, um, well, I appreciate those comments. So, well, listen, we're just about to the top of the hour. I want to thank Doug and Sonny and, and Jason and Buzz for chiming in like that. I hopefully folks got a view of what can be done related to regenerative ag and the role that soil health plays in that. Well, I think you, you're seeing from three producers that are making it work there in South Carolina, and there's countless others across the uh, across the country who are trying to make it work. And I invite you all to join us next week uh, for the uh, the role that regenerative ag and soil health is going to play in uh, U.S. cotton. And also ask that you take a minute and answer the survey at the end, and we'd appreciate that. And with that, again, thanks, gentlemen, and we'll say adios. Take care.